My name is Shaheen Khan. I'm an actress. <laughs> and where were you born? I was born in Moshi, Tanzania, um, which is in East Africa. And your family was a Muslim family? That's right, yeah. Uh, my parents had come over from what was then, you know, before partition. Um, my, my grandmother was a headmistress, and so she got a job in Tanzania. Um, so she came over. And my dad, who was, in, who was adopted, and he didn't want to be in the army, um, he was a pacifist, <laughs> and he wanted to teach, so he came to Africa. And then they had an arranged marriage in Africa. And why did they come to England? Um, well, I came over in 70, 1970, and things at that time in East Africa were quite turbulent. There was the whole Idi Amin thing going on in Uganda. And I think my dad felt, well, what happened was you had to take over Tanzanian citizenship if you wanted access to better schools and stuff like that. And my father didn't want to give up his um, British subject or whatever it was. And um, so he decided he was going to hold on to that. But because he wanted us to be educated in good schools, he sent my brother over here first. And then we came to visit my brother and then he decided actually it was time for all of us to come here because it was just safer and better. That's how he felt. Did you come to London? Yeah. In fact, we came and we stayed with some um, friends of my parents in Southfields. And, you know, it literally was like 21 of us or whatever. And uh, But it was amazing. You know, nowadays I'm not sure people would be willing to put up with so many people arriving into their little terraced house in Southfields. But these people were very generous and they did. And we used to have an amazing time. And I remember watching lots of Elvis Presley films in the afternoons <laughs> on a Saturday. <laughs> so yeah, no, it was, um, I, you know, when I look back on it, I think, gosh, how did we do it? Because when I see the footage of, you know, uh, Somali families now in London and how they live, well, actually, I've had a bit of that journey, you know. And was it a bit of a shock for you? Uh, yes. Because, you know, we had a big house in Africa, we had the servants, you know, it was very common to have servants. Nowadays, you can't even say the word because you feel so guilty. Um, but uh, it was a shock because there we were coming from a big house, lots of space, and I was a very outdoorsy girl. And uh, here we were was cold and the houses were small and everything was grey and uh, after we left our you know this house in Southfields we rented a place and we lived upstairs and I had my sister was 10 years younger than I was and she would run around and you know the people downstairs would scream and shout well we weren't used to you know walking slowly and actually we never had an upstairs because we had a bungalow <laughs> So we had to learn a lot of things very quickly. And um, then my parents bought a house. And, you know, there were those sort of East African nations where you think you have to pay cash for everything. So instead of getting a mortgage and buying a big house, they bought, all, spent all their money on buying outright a property in Wimbledon. And uh, we wa walked in there and there was nothing apart from uh, the people had left a bunk bed and two little kiddies' chairs, and that was it. And I remember going to, you know, we finally got a heater and used to go and get paraffin from the petrol station at the time. And I just remember being really cold. <laughs> and of course, we had hand-me-down clothes and everything. And I, I swear, when I look back on it, I think, oh my God, I really did look like the immigrant because not only did I have this coat, but I was so cold that I had to have an anorak on top. And it was like a turquoise anorak, hand me down. And I must have looked the right state. <laughs> what was it like at school? Well, it was interesting because at school, I met a Burmese girl. And she became my absolute best friend. And I still know her till today. So she kind of took me under her wing. And uh, I, I think she was born here. So she was very comfortable, you know, she knew everything around Wimbledon. 
she would take me on buses and I'd get really scared where was I going you know from school she'd take me there and then somehow she'd say home is that way and I'd be like but we have to go all the way back and she'd be like no you know so, so the geography of the place I was completely lost it took me ages to kind of get that you can go around this way you know because in Africa we didn't Although we, I walked to school at a very young age, like here, you wouldn't send your kids out to school, but there I did. But I don't know, I guess I knew that geography and then suddenly you're in a place like London. All the houses look the same, all the streets look the same. It was, yeah, it was a shock. <laughs> and was it mainly English um, kids that you had at school? Um, yeah, there were the odd uh, Jamaican, uh, a few of them, you know, and it really was a little bit, if you think about it, very stereotypical, you know, there was the Jamaican girl who's fantastic runner and, you know, uh, what I remember from my school, I suppose, are two things. One was um, how I started supporting Manchester United, because this girl, Dawn Glazier, came up to me and she said, you know, one of my first few days at school and she said, who do you support? Man United, Chelsea. I was like, um, sorry? Who do you support? Man United, Chelsea. I was like, um, um, can you say that again, please? Who do you support? Man United, Chelsea. And I went, oh, the first one. Because <laughs> I knew she was asking me to make a choice. I had no idea. She was like, oh, great, Man United, yeah. And so that's how I started supporting Manchester United. <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> So that was really funny. And then um, I remember doing an assembly in school where it was about good and evil. And the Jamaican girl was the devil. And the Burmese girl and myself were the like nymphs, you know, the, the devil's sort of sidekicks. And then the blonde girl was the good person that we were trying to get into our evil ways. Um, but we loved doing it. We had such fun. And it was so good that um, it got, somehow, this assembly got taken to Southwark Cathedral to be performed there. And so we performed it for a week. And it was a, one of the most joyous things I did. It's because I'd always wanted to act. So this was fantastic. But, you know, that kind of 1970s uh, stereotypes was quite interesting. So you said you'd always wanted to act. What did you want to do in acting? Well, when I was seven, my parents took me, we used to get the Chinese state circus because Tanzania was, you know, a socialist country and China had so much money going in there. So we had the Chinese state circus and the Indian state circus come and my parents used to take us. And I just fell in love with the young kids who were probably being <laughs> treated really badly, but I just saw them performing and this great audience watching them and everyone loving them. And I just thought, oh, I want to be on that sort of, you know, in that arena. Because um, I was hopeless at gymnastics. So, <laughs> or, you know, I couldn't possibly be one of those trapeze kind of artists in the circus. Um, but I just fell in love with acting and I thought, that is what I, that is what I want to do. And I, at age 11, when we came here, I got a paper round because I just needed to earn a little bit of money and stuff like that because my parents didn't have a lot. And I wanted to go on the school trips, pony trekking in Wales. So that was a way of earning some money. And I remember always singing the Beatles song in my head, you know. They're going to put me in the movies. <laughs> and you said you weren't musical. <laughs> I'm not very musical. But I have to get musical now. Why? Well, they're doing um, Bend It Like Beckham, the musical. So... You know, I have to at least give it a try. <laughs> well, good luck with that. Thank you. And how did you then embark on your career as an actor? Well, it was so funny because having wanted to act, I found that when I got to set, uh, high school, it was very much you were, you know, you could help out backstage or in costume or whatever, and I was not remotely interested in that. And then it was absolutely by chance, uh, because I'd been looking at sort of joining theatre companies, you know, local ones, amateur stuff, but I never 
got anywhere with that. And then um, I used to work at a doctor's surgery after school when I was 16. And a woman came in with her daughter who'd broken her leg, I think. And she said, oh, we happen to be looking for a young Asian actress. And we don't seem to have anyone on equities list. So would you like to come for an audition? So I was so excited. And I ran home after work and told my parents who said, absolutely not, you know, you're still at school. <laughs> You've got to just stay, stay at school, you're not going. So I pleaded with them and I said, I probably won't get it, but please let me just go. Anyway, I went, I did the audition. And uh, the BBC used to be in Ealing at the time. I went there and I got offered the part. And my parents were like, oh God, you know. And I was like, oh, please let me do it. Which meant I only went to school on a Friday, um, you know, for, for ages. And my headmistress had told my dad, you know, we're not very happy with this. And so anyway, it's funny because I've been back at my school and uh, it's so interesting how they're so supportive now of any, you know, anyone who does something different or whatever. Whereas there wasn't even a mention in the assembly or anything that, you know, this girl's got this amazing like 26 episode series of the first Asian program, you know, ever in Britain. Um, so there was no acknowledgement, nothing. It was just like, yeah, you've got it, whatever. We just want you to make sure that you, you know, hand in your work and all that. So could you let us know what that program was? It was called Parosi, which means neighbours. And at the time, because of uh, there were a lot of immigrants coming from Kenya and um, Uganda and all that, they wanted to help people uh, learn to speak English and, um, you know, know how to go and... Uh, sign on and get benefits and whatever. So it was a combination of trying to get people to teach English with, and then added on was a soap. So it was quite interesting. So with, through the soap people learned how to do, you know, sign on or whatever. But within that there was also like my character was a Hindu girl who was going out with a Muslim boy. And this is 1977, you know, and all the hoo-ha that goes with that. It's interesting. <laughs> Not so much has changed because I, you know, I know actresses who, even today, you know, they're in their thirties and they still go, oh, but you know, I'm a Sikh and he's a Muslim, and and you go, wow. I guess humans, essentially, we don't change. But you married somebody completely different. Completely different. Well, I'm a Muslim, married to a Jewish guy, so he's Canadian. I'm from East Africa. But we met, you know, we met in Wimbledon at the train station. Um, my friend knew his friend and we were going to the same college because what happened was having done this TV series, I got basically kicked out of school because I only managed to get, I think, one O level, which was in art. <laughs> so the headmistress called my dad in and said, I think, you know, she'd be better off somewhere else. So I went to Kingston College of Further Education, which looking back on it was an amazing place because so many people who had not fallen by the wayside but had a slightly different you know they weren't just school o level university da 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 it was people who had slightly done something different and ended up there because they wanted to study and it was an amazing place and i can't remember what i was saying <laughs> why how did i get to that why you married your husband? oh yeah my husband so uh, he had um, left Canada because he was getting into trouble there so he came over to England and he was at the college as well so we met and we were very good friends you know listen to Fleetwood Mac play tennis smoke cigarettes and drink tea and we became very good friends and he was actually with somebody else but then all that you know stopped and I was trying to help him and he was like actually I don't need any help because actually <laughs> you know and I was completely oblivious because I was a Muslim girl. Oh, I didn't even think that I'd ever have a boyfriend, you know. <laughs> so how did your parents respond to your whole acting lark, the school thing, and then a husband, you know, future yeah. husband? Well, my parents weren't that keen on me acting, but once I'd done it, 
I mean, they, actually, I don't remember. Do you know what? We didn't even have a TV for us to watch this program that I'd done. It's true. We didn't have a TV. <laughs> we were that poor. <laughs> uh, so I'd go to my friend, my Burmese friend Trudy's house to watch because she, you know, she was, um, she lived up the hill, I lived down the hill. She had a TV. So I'd go and watch it there. But sometimes I'd miss it because it was on at 9.15 on a Sunday morning. I mean, what 16-year-old wants to get up <laughs> that early? So I'd miss it, you know, and they were, didn't have video recorders. You miss it, you miss it. Um, and then my parents, my father died just before, uh, just after I'd met uh, my husband, my boyfriend. Um, he passed away. So it was a very difficult time, you know. Um, but in some ways that kind of helped me bring him into my house. And so he was very supportive to my mum and me and all that. And because his mum was in Canada, my mum kind of became like a surrogate mum almost to him. And I remember when I used to go on tour, he'd go there. And he never understood when English people made jokes about uh, mother-in-laws because he'd be like, what's funny? What's I love my mother-in-law. <laughs> so coming back to your own artistic journey, how then did you move from the soap into acting, other things? Well, I tried again to, there used to be an amateur group called Serendipity in Wimbledon, and you know, I tried with them and it just wasn't happening. And then a friend of mine, you know, um, brought a time out and in there she said, look, look, there's this Asian theatre company who are looking for people. And I thought, wonderful. So I gave them a call and it was just after my dad had died in 1979. Um, so I was a bit worried about leaving my mum and going off, you know, to this theatre company, whatever. But anyway, they used to meet on a Wednesday at Millen Centre in Tooting Beck. <laughs> and uh, I think I called them and they said, come along. I did, where I met Jatinder and all the founding people like Oves and Praveen and uh, Sunil. And uh, I just fell in love with the whole thing. It was so exciting. It was all oh, these Asians, we were talking about what it's like to be here, um, our constraints, you know, we want to do this and that and the other, but our parents are saying you can't or whatever. So it was a really exciting time. And, uh, and they were all very, you know, clever. They were very intellectual. And that, for me, it was very attractive. Um, I was just like, wow, you know, and they were very political as well. And um, it sort of ignited lots of things in me. And it was the one thing I would not give up for anybody. And, you know, when you first start going out, going out with somebody, you know, you give up everything to be with them. But Wednesday evenings were so precious, nobody, not even Joel, could sort of break in, you know, into a Wednesday evening. <laughs> which I just think is great because I just feel like yes actually when you're so passionate about something nothing will break your focus but because of your background your upbringing the politics that the Tower people are going through um, probably didn't affect you personally except maybe as an outsider and a, as observer well, well, I don't understand well because you're, um, it seemed to me like your parents were quite liberal yeah. You know, and you had a boyfriend that was not from Asian yeah. background. Yeah. Um, so it seems like you didn't have the kind of pressures that a lot of Asians Well, the have. thing is, I did, but I had to um, fight for everything I got. You know, it just, it, it wasn't like my parents were like, oh yeah, you've got a boyfriend, it's fine. Not at all, you know. Um, it, w you know, they didn't like, my mum didn't like it very much you know there was it, it was difficult sometimes um, certainly the extended fam family didn't like it at all but in some ways I suppose if maybe if my dad had been there it would have been a harder battle maybe because mum and dad would have been together and to try and break two maybe is harder I don't know and my mum being a widow maybe made things a little bit 
easier because she was on her own. But then I had an enormous amount of guilt and stuff like that as well because I used to feel bad that I wasn't at home with my mum and, you know, out with my boyfriend. But I tried to balance it. But acting-wise, they came around to your acting profession. They did eventually, but, you know, my mum, she used to say to me, because what happened, they wanted me to study, carry on studying. I wanted to go to drama school, but they... You know, they were like, no, you've got to go and do, do a degree. And so I did my degree and I said to my mum, here, you have this, this is what you wanted. And now I'm off touring with Tara, you know. So it was constantly, um, you know, she, she would have liked me to have been a news presenter. That would have been like for her great. Or to get a nice office job where I had a table, a desk and, you know, a telephone. <laughs> and for me, one of the saddest things is... You know, um, sometimes when I used to do uh, TV screen to films or dramas, we'd sit there and watch them. And uh, she never really said, oh, I'm so proud of you or whatever, ever. But, you know, um, for me, one of the saddest thing is like, I know she would have really loved Bhaji on the beach. You know, that film would have talked to her on so many levels. And unfortunately, she died just before it came out. So for me, that has always been, I think maybe that would have shown her that actually your daughter, you know. But I think she got that sense of me from other things, like my relationship with Joel. You know, I'd been with him seven years. So she didn't, it wasn't just like, oh, you're going out, you know, you're a bit of a prostitute going out with lots of boys. She could see that actually, in a lot of ways, um, I was quite conservative because I'd gone out with this one guy for seven years and then got married to him, you know, and then had kids. And so she saw all that stuff that made her feel like I was in, not, like in a safe environment, if you know what I mean. Stable. Yeah, yeah. So for somebody who's quite radical in a lot of ways, you know, essentially there's also that stability, yeah. So you started off doing um, a series, TV series, and then you went and joined Tara and did completely different things because you're then exploring a lot of different philosophies yeah. and perspectives. So tell us about that exploration within you. Um, well, what was exciting, because I'd, I'd done a degree uh, in sociology and politics, and I found that when I joined Tara as a professional, when I completed my degree, was there was a lot, like we'd go and research. Our plays were based on research we did in the community. And I loved that. It kind of made me feel like I was using a bit of my other brain and, you know, all the things I'd learned. Um, and I also really enjoyed the way Jatinda brought in all that Indian old sort of plays like Mitikigari, which is one of my most favourite plays that we did at Thara, you know, with the whole stylized kind of way of working. And, um, what's that little? <laughs> um, I've lost my train of thought now. Um, the old plays. Yeah. Um, I can't remember what I was saying. Sorry, I keep hearing the door. <laughs> <laughs> Hello? Hello, sorry, I'm sure. How are you? It's okay. You can come and say hello, and then go. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. Bye. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. That's fine. Right. Mm. Uh, um, so, yeah, you're talking about the old plays, you know, Indian plays. Um, so it was actually an exploration for you about the different heritage, isn't it? Sorry, I've completely lost... Because that's the Jewish Canadian. <laughs> um, my heritage. Okay, now, sorry, can you ask that question again? Yeah, I was just wondering how the Tara Arts experience kind of impacted on you as an Asian woman. Um, I suppose because of the, the kind of things that we were exploring within, you know, we were also exploring like uh, Asians coming into Britain here and here to stay and all that kind of stuff that was going on at the time you know um 
going on marches, anti-Nazi, um, anti-apartheid. So it was a really political time. So I know that that certainly uh, impacted on how I viewed the world. And so I would take all that with me. And, you know, it was a point of interest because, like, you're, you could fight some of those battles with that knowledge, with your parents, if you know what I mean, you know. You and said it, you did a lot of research as well. Yeah, I mean, we did a play on mental illness uh, called Meet Me, and we went into hospitals uh, at Springfield in Tooting, which was a mental hospital. And because there, w the reason we were interested in it, because there were so many more um, black and Asian people suffering mental illness, and we wanted to see whether it was, you know, within the diaspora, there's an, uh, sort of, it's unequal, you know, what's the, for the percentages are much higher. So we were interested in, in, in exploring that. And, um, you know, my own brother at the time was going through a massive breakdown. So I found it really, really fascinating. And then you realise actually it's not that he's just being a pain in the arse and not wanting to get out of bed, but actually he has some severe mental problems. And, uh, y you know, we discovered that coming over here, not speaking the language or whatever, even speaking the language, my brother, you know, he won the debating society thing in Africa and stuff like that. but he suffered racism and all kinds of things and it kind of impacted on him to the and at the end I mean he was doing very very well he was in the merchant navy traveling around he, you know he became an officer and was going up the ladder and then something happened uh, where I think one of the Iranian guys on the ship was treated very very badly to the point that he I think they kind of locked him up or something and that really impacted on my brother because that was his very good friend. He was very young as well, he was in his 20s. And um, so when he came back, he was a completely changed guy, you know. But then I think, you know, my parents sent him over here uh, on his own because he was so clever and he needed to... So he was sent here to do computer science and at the time it was a big thing, you know. And he was living with some relatives in Walthamstow who were really backward. You know, he had no freedom at all. He was going to school in Woolwich, and at that time, Canning Town or Silvertown. I mean, it's still hairy, <laughs> scary, but, you know, at the time, it was very racist. So I can sort of understand how it kind of broke this person. So at the time, it was quite interesting for us to be doing Meet Me and then having a parallel kind of thing happening, you know. And so many of us had someone in our family who was having some kind of um, breakdown or mental problem, yeah. So did you suffer racism yourself in the acting profession? In the acting profession? Well, blatant racism, like when we did Barossi, you know, somebody actually, um, one of the crew, had written something like Packies Go Home or I can't remember exactly what it was, but we came into work one day and there was this stuff. And I was quite young, so you know, it was like, oh my God, that's terrible. But the older actors were f absolutely fuming and so they, I can't remember if they took it up with equity or not or whatever. I can't remember. So there was that kind of thing. Um, this was a theatre that you were touring to? Or? Th this was the BBC. Yeah, at um, TV Centre, you know, when you used to do it in the studios there. Um, well, I, I suppose racism kind of shows itself in lots of different ways. And if I think about it, you know, um, when I was doing Casualty, my character, you know, was an Asian nurse and they wanted to go down the same route. She wanted to leave home to go and live in the nurses' quarters or something. Her parents weren't wanting her to, her to leave home. And at the time, I'd been to St George's Hospital and the nurses there were wanting to get rid of those um, paper hats that they used to wear. 
So I said to them, look, this would be a really interesting story because it's happening right now. Nurses are trying to get rid of these. And, you know, there were Asian nurses at St. George's then. And I thought this would be such an interesting different storyline. And so I used to have little battles like that with them. And one day, one of the directors, he said to me, if you carry on like this, you know, you won't be working for the BBC. And I just thought, my God. And, and sometimes, you know, you, you, it's a difficult situation when you haven't got a lot of power. What do you do? You know, so I just found it very frustrating. I love the people um, who I worked with, uh, but it became, it, was, it wasn't the kind of work. You know, I'd come from Thara where we were doing like proper work and here they are going on, you know, odd lines here and there and, oh. I was just like, yeah, whatever. So it was really important that theatre companies like Tara Arts, Tamasha, um, Kali, um, that they provided a source of inspiration and also a place where you could actually explore all these issues. Yeah, yeah it, 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 they are. And some of my most wonderful times I've had have been in those spaces. And I was saying to my daughter, Sophie, who's also acting now, um, she wishes there was, you know, she could join a theatre company because we were like a troupe. And that, there's something quite wonderful about being together intensively like that and working and experimenting. And that's what I miss now, is that kind of experimental stuff. You know, just let yourself go. Everyone's too, like, homing into, I don't know, Stuff that's a bit boring. Anyway. <laughs> so this um, British South Asian theatre sector, it's, um, how valid do you think it is to this day? The, the work that they're doing? I think it's really, really, really important. You know, because if you look at it, if there wasn't that, where would we be really? Because I don't feel, I mean, fine, there are the odd people who are doing mainstream stuff, but we're not there, as far as I'm concerned. So we need these places like Thara, like Kali, like Tamasha, you know, providing a platform for people. I mean, my own daughter, uh, Nyla, she's now a TDA artist with Tamasha. You know, she's developing her work through them. I can't see where else she would find, you know, uh, I mean, fine, you can go to the Royal Court and whatever, but I, th I think those sort of theatre companies are crucial. So it's really valid to this day? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, because I, I really do feel if those places weren't there, you know, like Ishi Din, I don't know if you know him, but He's a taxi driver. He had an idea. You know, which theatre, white theatre company would give him the opportunity? I mean, even Ayub Khan then, you know, he touted his script for years. Nobody was interested in East is East. It wasn't until Sudha and I, you know, because we were the, called the Lonely Hearts Club, because we used to tour together. And um, he, uh, we were going out because Sudha and I were writing girlies at the time and so we said to him we need to go to a nightclub but we, to do research but we don't want to go just the two of us so can you being a man come with us and he begrudgingly came out and we had a lonely hearts night out and then on the way back Sudha said you know bring out that script because we always thought it was fantastic she said bring it out and you know let me see what I can do through Tamasha with it and he was like, no, no, I've had enough, I've bloody had enough of that, you know, I'm, it's in a draw, I'm not taking it out, I've got this other script. She said, no, I'm not interested in the other one, I want that one. And of course, you know, the rest is history. So, for those reasons, you know, I think Gurpreet, a lot of her work has come through Kali, I think, has started, and now she's at the Royal Court, you know. Nowadays with companies like Rifco Arts, where they are doing a lot of Bollywoodish type productions, um, and there's been slight change and shift in the way that um, they've been 
marketing things to audiences, for example, um, perhaps less issue-based, but issue-based nonetheless, through um, musicals, um, that kind of genre. Um, how do you feel that the changes in British South Asian theatre involvement um, is influencing today's society? Hmm. Well, I saw Rifko's play, um, Britain's Got Pungra, at Stratford East. That was fantastic, absolutely brilliant. And the audience was predominantly Asian the night I went, certainly. And uh, I think Asian people now have got to the stage in Britain where, you know, they, uh, going to the theatre is part of their culture now as well, I think. It's, it's interesting, actually, because I remember the Marshes sort of um, had a big audience, like at the Lyric and at Hampstead. Um, but I think what can happen is if you don't keep providing stuff in those theatres that appeals to the, the, you know, the South Asian community, then what happens is they sort of fall by the wayside again. And I think that's some of the problems I find with mainstream theatres is there isn't like a... Um, a constant, you know, involvement. It's like the odd little uh, play about partition or the odd little thing. Um, and there isn't a, like a consistency and I, it would be interesting to... For me, what I'm looking for... I think it's great that, you know, they do Bhangra and different genres. I think that's fantastic. I think we need to explore different... We, and we don't need to just be issue-based either. Um, issues should just come out like how they do in our day-to-day -day life, you know, when the, somebody gives me a funny look or will say something racist. I mean, I was quite shocked the other day. I was sitting at home, I was practicing the piano. The door went in a very aggressive way, a knock, 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 and I thought, oh, God. So I thought, I'll just look through the window, see who it is. And it was some men selling some manure or something. Um, so I looked out the window, and as he walked past, one was at the door, one walked past, and he went, oh, there's a packy at the window. And I was so shocked, because I, <laughs> I haven't heard that for so many years. And anyway, so that was, I don't know why I'm telling you that. Um, there was a reason. It was, uh, <laughs> I can't remember. It's the public's perception still. Yeah, it's yeah. still a packy. Yeah. So did well, you... I know things are changing. Oh, I know, that's what I was going to say, was what I would like to see, um, what I myself am interested in, is just seeing not big things like people, girls running away. Or I know it's still happening, you know, the whole honour thing. It shocks me that's still going on, but it does. Um, but I'd like to see um, a more nuanced kind of play on stage, you know. I would love to have, you know, those wonderful plays you go and see where... It's these families and these little secrets come out over dinner or whatever. You know, those are the kind of plays that now I'm interested in, in seeing on stage and even maybe, you know, writing for them. Yeah. So really it's informing audiences and ed educating them. Um, informing and educating. Engaging, I think. Okay. And then they can do whatever they want with it, you know. Yeah. But audiences are integral, therefore, in your work. Yeah, I mean, for me, you know, all the films that I've done, all this, they've been mostly about an Asian community. So for me, that is my access or contribution to... I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> no, but if you've I don't done know, what, like... I'm, what am I trying to say? Oh, I don't know. But if you've done things like Casualty, yeah. where the demographic, audience demographic, is not just Asian, yeah. it's across the board, yeah. um, and then you're doing plays that have predominantly a focus on Asian, for Asian audiences, um, how do you view your audiences? How would you like to have in your ideal setting situation? What kind of audiences would you like to see all of your work? I think I'd like to see a mixed audience. You know, I, I remember when I did Bhaji on the Beach and uh, we were at a film festival in uh, Spain. 
and it was fantastic because the Spanish people were like, oh my God, you know, that was just like us. That was just like my family or whatever. And for me, that gives me the greatest pleasure is when you touch people of a different culture because essentially we are all humans universally the same. You know, we all have the same issues. Love, joy, whatever. Bitterness, angst, it's all part of the human condition. So we share that, but it just comes from a different angle. And how do you feel that the um, South Asian theatre has evolved to change perceptions? How has it evolved? Because I'm thinking really Tara started off because of a racist killing. Yeah. Of course, like probably the other end of the spectrum, yeah. and that has been a journey of quite a few decades. Yeah. And you've actually been witness to this yeah. change, and I just wonder whether you care to comment on that. I think it's really exciting. You know, when we used to chant, chant here and here to stay. You know, and I look and think, yes, we did it. You know, at that time, it was like we were so adamant we were here, and uh, and. Actually, yes, we have been here like 30 odd years and we're still here and we're still in a profession that's uh, sometimes wonderful, sometimes in equal measure, you know, difficult, um, heartbreaking, uh, frustrating, but we're still here and, and, and there are so many people doing so many things. And of course now, in some ways I think, oh my God, am I a bit too old, but there's this whole social media kind of stuff that's also very exciting. And some of the th ways I've seen people work, um, I think that would be the next kind of, um, you know, the integration of all that kind of stuff, technology and everything in place. That would be quite interesting as well, I think. Um, you commented on the casualty situation about the nurses and the issue of the, the hats. Um, we had a question from some of the rural um, participants in this project saying that they didn't feel connected to theatre, um, I mean partly because theatre doesn't go to a lot of rural areas. Um, theatre has a very select audience, but it's able to choose and focus its audience a little bit more, whereas um, the theatre television stations are looking at the wider audiences. So the televisions do go into rural um, homes and sitting rooms. They're, they're, they are therefore presenting, from your experience, quite a different Asian perspective from the grassroots theatre scene. Mm. Um, and you talked about less power having less power in, in that situation to a, be able to change storylines. How do you see rural audiences benefiting from any South Asian theatre work if they can't see it? For example, technology. Is there some way? Have you got any ideas? Anything in the ether? How would they, how would they benefit? Mm. How can they see this work? Do you think there should be more funding going into rural uh, uh, touring, for example? Um, well, I think it would be great to take theatre to as many people as possible, you know, even if you did it in a barn or whatever. You know, I've performed in tiny little spaces in school, or whatever. Um, I think that would be great. Um, what would also be great, of course, is, you know, if you could um, get audiences. I know it's really, really hard. It's a very hard, I find it a very hard question because actually um, I can't think how, I'm thinking of someone in Cornwall, you know, miles from anywhere. How do you get them to see like a, a Tamasha production or something? I don't know. Right, let's move swiftly on then, shall we? <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Perhaps you'd like to tell us about um, any particular work that you've done in the past that holds great value for you. Oh, gosh. Um, 
There are so many, really, you know, because absolutely I love the theatre and I really enjoy doing film as well and radio. You know, I've had some of my most wonderful times doing radio as well. Um, but I suppose if I think of it, something I, for, for me, I know Bendit like Beckham is like a, a really big film. But my, my entire experience of that was so wonderful that there are lots of little things that I take away from that and take into my... It, I move forward with that. Like the way I got the job. You know, they didn't want me to do it. I had to... Um, because I happened to bump into Gurinda in a restaurant and she was with the producer. And I just said, you know, what are you up to? And she told me she was doing this film uh, about a footballer, a girl. And she said, oh, but uh, you're too old to play the young girl and you're too young to play the mum. And those are the parts. So I thought, nah, I'm not too young to play a mum. I can do it, you know. So I asked her and she was a bit dismissive. And then I asked Christine Landon-Smith, who was the artistic director at Tamasha, I said, Christine, will you hot seat me? Because I knew this from Tamasha, you know, they do this technique. And I thought, hot seat me as, the, as this mother. And then I got Sudha Butcher, her mum's clothes, <laughs> put them on. Christine hot seated me. We sent the cassette to Gurinda and she asked me to come in for an audition. I went for the audition in Sudha's mum's clothes and uh, got a call saying, um, you were really good, but we think you're just too young. You know, so then I went back again, no makeup, Sudha's mum's clothes with a little hunch <laughs> because I had to plead them to see me again. They saw me again and then it was this painstaking like few weeks where I just thought, okay. Anyway, I knew it was between me and another actress and the tapes went out to LA and apparently they all sat in a room and each person came, watched the two tapes and voted. And then it was the final, the producer definitely didn't want me, but it was his wife, apparently, who voted for me and her vote was the last one which counted. So that's how I got the part. So it was, that taught me perseverance. You know, again, it was that Wednesday, no going anywhere, focus. And I was really focused. It was, you know, it's always like uncomfortable to ask a friend for a favour and stuff, but I asked Christine, I did it, you know. So I think that really helped me. And then when I worked on the f um, film, it was quite difficult because I had to go into Punjabi and English in a very quick way. So that was a learning thing. And also, there were some scenes, you know, there's one scene absolutely that I improvised that's in there. And I was, we were just hanging around waiting for them to set up the lights and I just sat there with the, the guy who played my husband and um, I just started improvising because, you know, that's what we used to do at Thara all the time, just improvise and play. And Gurinda heard, overheard this little thing, scene that we were doing and she said, we're going to shoot that, you know. And it really helped because in the arc of the story, you didn't get how the parents thought. Otherwise, I think the just that little tiny scene just helped the parents to be slightly soft. You kind of saw a parent's agony for their children, you know. And I, for me, I don't know, I just find it just helped the arc for my, my character's arc. Um, and I'm really proud of that. And one of the things that you're really proud of, or should be, is um, your work producing a daughter that's now following in your footsteps. That's right. <laughs> yes, and we should have a chat with her. Yes, we should. Yes, okay.